Hello and welcome to Talking Africa, the podcast that gets behind the news from the continent, brought to you by the Africa Report magazine. And you can always check us out online for daily news and features at theafricareport.com. My name is Anne-Marie Besada, and I hope that you and all your loved ones are still keeping safe during this global pandemic. On our website, much of our coverage has been focused on the sub-Saharan African region. But what about the north? And specifically, what about Egypt, whose economy was just starting to pick up following its revolution of 2011 and 2013? In today's podcast, we delve into the north with Mohamed El Dashan, a development economist and founder and managing director of Oxcon, a consulting firm that focuses on the developing world. We begin our discussion with an overview of the effects of COVID-19 across North Africa. If we look at the the crisis as it's entering each country, certain governments have announced measures to boost formal uh, industry. These aren't necessarily governments that have the means, like Saudi Arabia, for example, to provide millions or billions of programs like that. Will that create some sort of huge strain on the system as it is now? Or are we seeing that perhaps certain governments are actually already planning ahead or taking measures to avoid the worst case scenario? I think most countries are actually taking the right call right now, which is sort of not to worry too much about whatever addition to the fiscal deficit that they're going to create this year. I think most governments are aware that this is a time of severe emergency for their economies. And yeah, all of them will have to dig into their coffers. All of them will probably have to borrow to cover their short-term needs. It will depend on sort of how the long term happens. But yeah, certainly governments have a, sort of across North Africa uh, gone into devising programs to support the various industries. So Egypt, for instance, has earmarked 100 billion Egyptian pounds which is roughly six and a half billion dollars. Tunisia also set up a fund for two and a half billion Tunisian dinars, which is 850, 860 million US dollars. These are supposed to support the industry. Different governments as well have set up stipends and whatnot for people who have recently fallen into unemployment. Uh, Some have also been attempting to do that for uh, workers in the informal sector as well, which is something we'll probably talk about in a little bit. So governments are aware that this is a time of emergency spending, inevitably. I'm positive, nonetheless, that this may not necessarily go into a long-term burden for the government. Tourism is one of the biggest sectors for at least Morocco, Tunisia, and Egypt, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Um, Yep. Now I'm understanding that the impact that they could take could go from anywhere between 2 to 3% of a hit. Would they be able to recover from that in the next year, or is this going to be sort of, you know, like the post-Arab Spring tourism was decimated all across the board, and they're, everyone is just starting to get back into it now. Are we going to be at a ground zero, do you think? Tourism is a very, is a very bizarre industry because it sort of collapses very quickly and it takes a very long time to recover. If you're drawing that... On a graph, imagine that you have like a really sharp fall and then a very slow comeback up. And Egypt has seen that, as you mentioned, in in 2011, 2013. It has taken some time for for, for the industry to come back. I think most people do not expect that this year or the next year uh, will will improve in no small part, not just because of what sort of the receiving countries do, but also on whether sort of the travelers and the tourists themselves feel sufficiently secure to travel, right? So... Tourism sort of has this mix of real economic factors, but also of perception factors that are also really important. For the time being, yeah, I mean, all those countries will have to think of very good policies to shore up their to shore up their tourism sector, but also to support all the workers that work in the in the tourism uh, industry, whether it's people working in it directly, so people who are really are working in hotels and whatnot. Uh, but also other people who work in other industries that supply the tourism industry. So everything from food and food, agriculture, transportation, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these uh, will have to sort of be part of the plans of those countries when they're trying to support the uh, tourism industry. But yeah, for unfortunately, for the next year or two, this is going to be a tough time for these countries. Well, we've already seen that Morocco has drawn down 3 billion in IMF liquidity lines. 
Tunisia has already requested IMF help, and Algeria is exploring assistance from the IMF. So we're already seeing them enter this exact pattern that you were just discussing. My understanding is that Tunisia hasn't yet uh, drawn on that facility. They're asking for it to be available. But nonetheless, I don't think there's anything wrong with countries sort of borrowing on the short term to cover needs, but it really is up to them whether this is going to, in, this is going to last longer or not, whether this is going to be really the beginning of a, of a cycle of borrowing or if this is really emergency assistance for which the need will go when the crisis ends. And with regards to the formal sector, which we know is quite massive, how is that being dealt with? Because Clearly, if you try to do a curfew or a semi-lockdown, you can't enforce it everywhere. So are there measures are being taken or are measures being even taken with the consideration to that sector? In Egypt, as well as really all across North Africa, the informal sector is quite massive in terms of employment, but also in terms of contribution to GDP. And sort of the numbers of informal sector workers in the total workers is sort of ranges from... 32% in Tunisia to 40% in Morocco, 50% in Algeria to 60% of all workers in a country like Egypt, which makes it one an, an incredibly important sector to deal with when it comes to offering support in crises, but also in terms of making sure that we are able to put that sector back into work once the crisis subsides and we're able to people are able to go back to their jobs. Now, those people who largely have no access to health insurance, have no access to social safety nets, and so on. So a number of governments in the region have tried to come up with, with measures for, uh, to support informal workers, but they are largely quite massively insufficient, right? So in Egypt, the government is offering a stipend of 500 Egyptian pounds per month for uh, three months, which I think is like $35 per month, and only for three months for people who are unregistered workers. Tunisia is only marginally better, but also widely insufficient. So, so these are sectors that are quite outside of the support packages, really, that are being offered. And, and then that's a problem. That's a real weakness. Uh, one question that kind of came to mind is that there's been a yeah. lot of calls for an elimination of African debt, or at least a suspending African debt for two years, just to allow all the African economies to kind of deal with the crisis without any exterior obligations. Um, and it's been, of course, a lot more concentrated on sub-Saharan Africa. But for the North African region, would that actually help? Or is, are they kind of, is it really a divide still between North and South? It's not really a divide between North and South. And I think all developing countries could certainly benefit from a forgiveness of debt or a partial forgiveness of it, even if it's just like forgiveness of the interest rates of the debt for a sort of period of time, which is one thing that has been sort of debated over the past couple of weeks, because it's true that so debt service can end up taking ridiculously large amount of national budgets every year of national expenditure. And it is, yeah, for some countries, it's an obscene sum of money that really should be going into development uh, and into infrastructure. If we're ready to have this conversation seriously, if we're ready to see what kind of support we can offer countries in terms of debt forgiveness or debt relief or even just debt rescheduling is definitely something that is worth pursuing. Now, we've had different examples over the past 20, maybe 30, 40 years even, of countries that have had their debt forgiven and have gone back immediately into new debt cycles. And this is the kind of sort of counter arguments that are often being made by people who are against uh, the idea of debt relief or debt rescheduling. And that sort of puts a little bit the onus on us as Africans and as people from countries that are indebted to really take the lead in this conversation and see what are the kind of things that we can offer, I don't want to say as guarantees, but at least have a clear plan of how we're going to sort of manage our resources uh, from now on, how we're going to sort of avoid falling back into that, say, the same debt cycles. And I really think that by and large, African countries are very much capable of doing that. Algeria, um, it was my understanding that when the government implemented measures that the the movement, the Hirak movement, actually divided. And many were saying, no, the government is doing this as a ploy to stop us. This is not a real virus. This will not actually be a problem. We should remain on the streets. And then others who said, it's okay, we can put this on hold. Um, and I'm wondering... 
Well, I, clearly, right now, everyone is off the street. But did that? Do you think that may have had any um, created any long-lasting fissures in the movement, or is that a little too too much speculation? So I think all countries people were a little doubtful of whether governments were actually trying to use that for their own advantage. Uh, and I think that actually isn't just an African issue. I think a lot of people sort of in, in the number of countries were wondering whether that was an excuse for increased surveillance or something. But what in Algeria, for instance, what didn't help at all is that even during the crisis, the government didn't put down its metaphorical arms. If I'm not mistaken, on March 24th, it's a court in Algeria sentence an opposition figure to a year in prison. So that was sort of in the height of the uh, crisis response, right? So it's clear that the tension between the government and the Harak movement is still there. And I don't think that the internal disagreements within within Harak at the beginning of the crisis will have a lasting impact because I think the government has had had the opportunity to sort of extend an open hand and they missed it. Now we'll take a closer look at Egypt. To look at Egypt's specific case, you mentioned that about 100, and, 100 billion pounds, so about, like you said, 64 million U.S., has been allocated to, to combat the virus. Do we have any details or any idea of how this is being spent? So not sufficiently, not sufficient details about this. We know that this is supposed to go to, most of it will go to the larger industries. For instance, one of the things that we were wondering whether any of that is going to small and medium enterprises. Uh, which represents the bulk of the formal labor. So definitely there are some details that need to be announced or they need to be ironed by the governments. There are different measures as well that they've taken. So Egypt, as well as other countries, have reduced the central bank interest rates. They are exempting companies and individuals also from late payments or non-performing loans, fees and uh, and fines. So there's a number of, of financial measures as well that, that they put that they put like that. In addition, they have created some industry specific uh, support systems. So for instance, in Egypt, they created a two year credit facility for the tourism industry. So to support hotels, make sure that the industry doesn't collapse. In, in this time of low tourism demand. That's sort of a bit of an overview of the measures. Why have investors then withdrawn between 7 to 9 billion U.S. from the country's debt and equity markets since the start of the pandemic? Is there an explanation to it or what impact that might have? A lot of what is labeled as foreign investment really is is kind of hot money, is, is short-term purchase of treasury bonds and so on. So it's not very surprising that like an asset that is that liquid that investors would seek to withdraw that, especially if they're expecting different different countries to sort of set up measures to, for instance, limit, limit withdrawals or potentially limit international transfers and whatnot. So it's sort of that panic is not, shall we say, it doesn't particularly scare me on the long term. I think that reaction is sort of completely expected. But if we really want to look into that, I think we need to ask ourselves why Egypt has been primarily attracting short-term hot money investment as opposed to sort of long-term investment. Now, this potentially might be an interesting question to discuss. But for that short-term withdrawal of short-term lending, uh, no, that's not so much of a concern. Well, then going back to your question, why is that interesting? So Egypt has actually, over the past several years, uh, has been engaged in, shall we say since 2016, has been engaged in, uh, in a pretty big economic reform program. And one of the pillars that they've been touting is that, that the government has been able to uh, attract investment. Now, the truth is, most of the investment that they've attracted is only an investment that, most of the foreign investment that they've attracted has been investment that came to the country attracted by the high interest rates and the fact that sort of the country seemed more or less stable. It's not particularly productive investment, and it's not long-term investment. Now, this is important in that particular discussion of the COVID crisis, is that if we're looking at how North African countries or really developing countries are going to weather the crisis in the medium and long term, and we have to look at what kind of economic plans they're putting in place, what kind of economic diversification they're aiming at. Now, if a country is sort of dependent on selling treasury bonds to foreign investors who only come for the high interest rates, then this is definitely not a good 
strategy when it comes to economic diversification, right? That's not money that's not going to stay in. It's money that is not particularly productive either. It helps the government, shall we say, run its business or also help the government say that it has attracted foreign investment.